Good evening and uh, welcome to the 164th monthly meeting of Foswell. Uh, I think just one or two people are there. Foswell, who are new, Foswell stands for Friends on Same Wavelength. That's the acronym. And we have monthly meetings on the third Saturday of the month without fail at 6.15 on Zoom now. Earlier, it was a physical meeting. Before we commence the evening's proceedings, let me extend on behalf of the president of Foswell Hyderabad, a warm greetings on the occasion of our 76th Independence Day, which we uh, recently celebrated. And I'm sure all of us were very, you know, swollen with pride to see the kind of celebration that celebrations that took place across the country. Uh, I think many of us who were born after the independence do not realize the value of freedom. But in this forum, especially, there are many who were born before freedom was attained. So it is of special significance to members of Foswell. With that, um, again, on behalf of the president of Foswell Hyderabad, I welcome all of you to the 164th monthly meeting. And without much ado, I'd like to call a, call upon a very young lad. He is in the 10th class in, um, uh, he is currently studying in 10th class in Gitanjali, Devashray, Parikshit Surana, to read the prayer. Parikshit, you can unmute yourself and read the prayer. Good evening, one and all. My name is Parikshit and I'm here to tell the prayer. Heaven of freedom. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where the knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where the words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever widening thought and action. Into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Thank you. Thank you, Parikshit. Parikshit is a, an ambitious young man. Uh, he is aiming to attempt the civil services and has started his preparation right now. You know, In fact, a year ago. So good to have you on this meeting, Parikshit. It is often a difficult task to introduce somebody who is uh, already known in the public domain as well as to many people on this call as well. But nevertheless, there are facets of each person's life which are not so well known, some of them at least. I'd like to call upon another young person, Catherine Sushmita. She is a, a student of pharmacy. She is doing a doctorate in pharmacy and she'll be graduating in a couple of months, I think in the next month itself. Catherine, would you introduce Dr. Varaprasad Reddy to us? President of Foswell, distinguished speaker, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to today's monthly Foswell meeting. Before I take the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker, please allow me to express my gratitude to Mr. Subha Rao sir for giving me the opportunity to participate in this event and granting me the honor of introducing our distinguished speaker, Dr. Varaprasad Reddy. I would also like to congratulate the entire team of Foswell for all their efforts in hosting this 164th monthly Foswell meeting. Dr. Varaprasad Reddy founded Shanta Biotechnics Limited in 1993. Shanta Biotechnics is an Indian biotechnology company based in Hyderabad. It is the first Indian company to develop, manufacture, and market recombinant human healthcare products in India. Shanta Biotechnics Limited was the first to develop and produce the first 
indigenous rdna hepatitis b vaccine followed by several other high end vaccines and drugs of international standards made available at an affordable price in the same spirit of producing low cost and high efficacious products several vaccines were developed which were approved by the who recently sanofi group has acquired majority stake in shanta biotechnics dr varaprasad reddy continues to be the chairman of the company dr varaprasad reddy has many prestigious awards to his credit with the most prestigious one being the padma bhushan awarded by the government of india in 2005 and the most recent one being the lifetime achievement award in 2019 by the ceos club india amongst several other awards including lifetime achievement awards from the institution of engineers india hyderabad management association hmtv entrepreneur of the year award for healthcare and life sciences by ernst and young in 2000 national technology award for shanvac b in 1999 and shanferon in 2003 department of scientific industrial research award by the government of india for best r and d efforts in industry for shanvac b in 1998 and for shanferon in 2003 he is on the boards of several organizations as the patron at abele member of aiba member of bcil life member of federation of asian biotech associations member of indian institute of public administration and at national biopharma mission as the chairman of the technical advisory group initiated by biotechnology industry research assistance council he is serving as a director on the board of several companies like shanta biotechnics private limited india sparsha pharma international private limited india sparsha pharma incorporated usa advanced bioscience laboratories incorporated usa Diabetomics Medical Private Limited, India; Diabetomics Incorporated, USA. Thank With you. With brief introduction, I'd like to present to you Dr. Varuprasad Reddy, our distinguished speaker for the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I think you did a good job of uh, making it so short. I don't think uh, I don't think it was an easy task. Yes, sir. Every meeting of Foswell is an endowment lecture, and today Dr. Varaprasad Reddy's lecture is to honor the life and work of a person who made a significant uh, difference in the country's bakery industry, and he is Sri Rathuri Baskar Rao, popularly known as Professor R. B. Rao. In the 1950s, he went to the uk and uh, graduated with honors in this food technologies came back worked in cftri in mysore and some of our old members may remember that he is the person who introduced mechanized sliced bread for the first time in the country in the 1940s uh, 1950s in delhi to start with and then he worked for a very long time and retired as the technical director of britannia so today's talk of dr varaprasad reddy is apt that he is delivering this because dr r b rao professor r b rao was also a pioneer in the food industry and he was regarded as the role model especially in the biscuit industry having worked in britannia for a very long time and before i call upon dr varaprasad reddy i just noticed that uh, mr professor t j ramurthy 
has joined us from Bangalore. Professor Ramurthy, are you there, sir? Ah, good evening, Subbara. This, this is that time I'm joining. No, 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 I not at all. I was only wondering that you'll be able to recognize. No, sir, I, I just saw your name. I want to pay my respects to my teacher from college. Professor Ramurthy was my electrical engineering teacher in RV College of Engineering. I'm so delighted you're here, sir. I spoke to Dr. Uh, Ranganath Shetty also. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, my pranams to you as my Thank guru. You. Nice to Thank see you. you. Yeah. You're okay. Thank you for welcoming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. It has been a fascinating, uh, co you know, few conversations that I had with Varaprasad Reddy. I was. Uh, I, I first uh, met him about 30, 40 years ago. I was uh, narrating to him the incident when he was in APEDC for a brief while. And uh, I was trying, I was toying with the idea of setting up a small scale unit to manufacture 10,000 push button telephones. And I was so overjoyed that I managed to get a license from the Department of Science and Technology after uh, a year of running around Delhi. And uh, I could not uh, really fathom the Shanta Biotechnic Varaprasad Reddy in my conversations with this person you see with us on the screen now. Sometimes it may seem, in Telugu we say, Atisayokti, you know, trying to um, make it uh, patronize or say more than what is true. But I leave it to you to gauge by the end of this meeting the kind of persona that uh, Varaprasad Redigaru has become and the spirituality that he has embraced apart after a huge success in a scientific field. He has done our country proud. He has done our state proud. He has done his village proud. But yet he wears all this with such a great sense of humility that it's almost disarming. May I now request you, Dr. Varaprasad Reddy, to share, us, share with us your life journey and the lessons gleaned from that. And incidentally, they, he has asked us a question. He can either take, speak for some time and take questions at the end of it, like we normally do. Or if you prefer that he speaks for the entire duration, he has assured that he will answer all questions by email. So by a show of hands, if you can just indicate to me what you prefer, would you like to like him to take up the questions now at the end of his talk? Just raise your hand, please. I don't see many hands. I need some guidance here. So does the speaker. Just raise your hand if you want him to answer questions live. I myself raise the hand. Okay. 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 So I think the decision is made. So the floor is yours. If you want to share your screen, Dr. Varaprasad Reddy. Namaskar to everyone. Uh, I am suggested to speak English because there are many non-Telugu people. I made a vote to myself that I will speak to my Telugu people only in Telugu. Uh, but once in a while, from English, please allow me to switch to my mother tongue Telugu so that I have not defied my own birth. Once in a while, where there are certain idiomatic expressions, only in mother tongue one can express very effectively. That's where I take take the shelter of mother tongue and you can understand what I mean because we're all in state of Pradesh. Maybe some people are from Bangalore. <clears throat> I was given the topic of uh, social entrepreneurism. In fact, entrepreneur itself is very, uh, what you call, strange word. We all know very industrious but not many entrepreneurs. But in recent times, every startup company, we are calling them as started by entrepreneurs. 
at least around two decades back, entrepreneur world is little new to the industrial community. In the industrialist, that is the standard word. But there is a subtle difference between entrepreneur and an industrialist. Uh, I will just go through two, three, on two, three counts, he is different from industrialist. An uh, entrepreneur should be a radical thinker. Industrialist need not be. He has to be more logical. He should be irrational in his desire for change. Entrepreneur should be very irrational. Unless he is irrational, he cannot put his foot forward. Industrialist will think twice before he takes any initiative for a new project or a new line. Because he has everything attained, money, name, fame, everything. And he doesn't want to risk it. The risk taking capacity will go down as he becomes an industrialist or he is growing as an industrialist. As an entrepreneur, he has nothing except his idea. He may not have gathered much mass with him. So he will be very, very risk-taking capacity. He has the highest risk-taking capacity and he is in a hurry to do something. And he should be having high tolerance to put up with ridicule and insults. An industrialist will not, he will be very careful to save his image. And also he should be tenacious to put up with uncertain results. He has, he has no calculation with him. Whereas the industrialist has many people to guide him, advise him, his auditors, his finance manager, financial controller, friends who are well versed with the industry. He has much contacts. So he'll be discussing his uh, new ideas to make sure that whether they are technically feasible, financially viable, all these kind of legwork he will do. An entrepreneur cannot have all that luxury. He has an idea. He takes it up, he will run after it without rhyme and reason, except that he wanted to bring a change in the present one. Either it be a product or it could be a service. He wanted to do something new. That is entrepreneur. But if you add social entrepreneur, it is qualifying an entrepreneur that he will not run after everything. It will occur to him only when there is a need, there is a concern as far as society is concerned, his environment. If he is finding something going very untoward things are happening in the society or there is a need in the society for such a product or for a service, for the lack of it, society is suffering, then he can take a call. That kind of person is called social entrepreneur. He will not go by routine method of uh, zeroing on a project. A seasoned industrialist will have all the calculations. He has a template. He will first see whether the product I am taking up is having priority. Is it in priority sector of the government? Whether government is giving any concessions for that? Also, he will see whether there is any favorable response from the bank for this kind of products or service. Third thing he sees that what is the technical obsolescence? How long this technology will last? Will I have to search for new projects later on? What is the product life cycle, etc. he will calculate. Not only that, he will look into ACGR, annual compounded growth rate, you will look into asset ratios like return on investment, return on equity, all kinds of jugglery. Unless he does that exercise, he will not come into the project. An entrepreneur doesn't know all these things. Most probably he'll be fresh from the college. Or maybe he has some experience as an as a employee. So he cannot have this uh, knowledge about calculating and taking a logical decision to start an industry. So social entrepreneurism is what, what, in my opinion, is a person who is affected by the environment and who has 
felt a need that he should take up something for the good of the society, then he is called a social entrepreneur. Then you can ask a question, a social enterprise, how it can help himself? Social enterprise is, it is not for making money. It is for doing something good to the society. Uh, if I am take, taking good care of the society, who will take care of me? That, we, that question will occur to him. So the answer for that is, is samskara to, to tell him or else the environment should teach him that sangho rakshati rakshitaha, that is the, our Vedavaku. So if you take care of society, society will automatically take care of you. That is the Nanudi in the Vedas. If he understands that philosophy, he will definitely plunge into the action and he will take up. And uh, if you do, not only that, because of his noble thinking for the society, not for making money, my belief, my faith is that it is a noble, he is doing that project for a noble cause. And unknown forces, if you call it Daivam, you call it Shakti, you call it nature, it will definitely come to his rescue and uh, he will be bestowed with all the power, might and necessary support system. The entire universe will conspire to make it happen, in my opinion. He will be safer because his nation was to take up a project for the cause of society. If, op if the objective is only to make money, there are many industries one he can think of. Even making liquor also is a very profitable business. Only one customer. Every annually, the government itself will raise its price. No need for any marketing team or designing a great uh, marketing, uh, what you call, strategy. So it is automatically done without any marketing team or sales force. One product, one customer, supply them. Every year, annual growth is there. You will be better off. But that is not the social entrepreneurism. That is not a project which is meant for helping society or people. It may give money, but it will not help. Such kind of projects are many, and all of them need not be successful, and all of them need not be failures. Some of them are successful based on several other factors. But if it is for a social purpose, I don't think any social entrepreneur has so far failed. That is my belief and faith. There may be some, what you call, hardships for him to go through the journey. But ultimately, he will be winning. What for he is taking the, the journey will prove him that he has done the right thing. He will have Atma satisfaction, self-satisfaction. And at the end of the day, more than the money, he will live in peace. He will sleep well and he will be definitely feeling good. And he can encourage other people also to follow the same path. Uh, the proof is my journey, Shanta Biotechnic. And uh, I have to give you some backdrop of the thinking when I started in 1991, I had this idea of starting up a biotech company, but it is not, I cannot um, tell any lie to you saying that I had the vision of doing something great in this country to save the people. I thought of doing something in healthcare. No, nothing of that sort. In fact, my background is electronics engineering. I, I have nothing to do with life sciences. And I have, as usual, as any ordinary student, I joined a job. I was not a job provider. At the time, I never thought of being an entrepreneur also. That kind of thinking was not there with me. I was a raw student. I passed out my engineering. I did my master's. Then I thought of joining a job. In those days, Getting a job in defense labs is very difficult. That too in R&D. My passion was R&D somehow. I believed that R&D is the one which will give me a satisfaction, not the routine uh, stereotype production. So when I joined DLRL, Defense Electronics Research Lab, I was an many employee. I never had this idealism of doing something for the country. But I noticed that the job I am doing in DLR has not given me any satisfaction. That is meant for import substitution. Our entire defense forces should be given an adequate support system to have an effective war. Unfortunately, 
the money that was pumped in into DRDO is very high at the time. I'm talking about 1970s. I joined the DLR in 1971. And uh, the outcome of any DRDO was not well utilized by our armed forces, Ministry of Defense. They were doing their job of developing indigenous in some of the equipment, but ultimately our armed forces and defense department was inclined to import things which already were at least made here as a prototypes. They never encouraged to continue the prototype section to regular production. That gave me some disappointment. I left the job. Then I joined a, an organization in state government for promoting electronics industries. Um, uh, so far, my experience in DLR was only to do R&D in electronics. Jammer controls was my subject in DLR. When I came to state government for promoting electronic industries, I could not understand how to read a balance sheet. In AP IDC, there was a subunit called AP Electronics Development Corporation. Because my, my background is electronics, they asked me to promote electronic industries. And in those days, there was joint venture concept. Government gets the license from the central government. State government will get the license from central government. Central government, in those days, is a license raj. Not, they were not they were not planning to identify the right kind of entrepreneurs. They were only reasoning out what kind of industry should come, but they were not aware of the right people who could take up to tackle these projects. They have passed on those licenses to state governments and state governments started industry development corporations. These people also didn't, didn't make much effort to identify the right kind of entrepreneurs. Mostly it was done for, for the favor to minister son-in-law or the bureaucrats uh, relative, they are the entrepreneurs. The joint venture concept is 50% by state government, 50% by the entrepreneur. To check how the company is running, what is the health of the company, we were nominated on the board of the promoted joint ventures. During that time, I noticed that all joint ventures promoted at that time, I'm not talking about it is, in 77, I joined state government. Most of the industries were running in losses and they were not very serious about uh, running the company effectively. And when I was nominated in the board, I was not able to read through the balance sheets and the financial statements. Then I did my evening MBA in Usmania, which is not of much use. I'm sorry to say that. Probably now they improved it. In 80, 80s, I joined Evening College. At least I learned how to read a balance sheet. It is not one balance sheet any company has. They used to have three to four balance sheets. One is for himself, the truthful. One is to the bank to mesmerize them. One is to income tax. If they make profit, they have to cover. Like that, one balance sheet reading itself is difficult for me. They were making three or four balance sheets. I found that this giant venture concept is not effectively, healthily working. So when I brought this to notice of my boss, he said that you should adjust and go move forward. Don't make complaints. Then I said, not a place for me to work. I left it. Then I joined an ongoing battery company, a great uh, educationist, very highly qualified person. Uh, he was... Uh, actually, he promoted a company for import substitution of defense batteries. So uh, he was most of the time spending on teaching and writing books. He was highly academic, very knowledgeable. He thought he should have a practical person to be his associate and partner. I joined him and uh, we together ran very well. Though he could not run it alone very effectively. And uh, after I joined, I have filled the gap of being practical and work-oriented. He is highly theoretical, very knowledgeable. He used to guide me. I used to work on this. Karirangam Nadi, Alochara Rangam He used to think I used to work. We, our combination did very well. And finally, we made it very good. But his way of thinking was different. My way of thinking was different. He didn't like my approach 
to the life and uh, we were bitterly separated. It is not a normal separation. Actually, he has, uh, he has eased me out of partnership. I was on the ropes without getting what I was supposed to get also. It was a legal battle. I was in depressive mood at the time. I was not able to cope up with the tragedy that happened to me in my career. I thought of going back to my village and I have, my father has agricultural properties. I thought of cultivating my land and then be peaceful at village. But again, Providence, I was, uh, I was trying to pacify myself to forget this bitter experience of partnership division. I uh, went to my, my cousin in USA called me uh, to forget this episode and then forget about that uh, whatever happened. Uh, for that change of place, change of mood, he asked me to come over there. I went to Cincinnati. There, my cousin was a life science scientist who worked in Hyderabad in NIA. There, uh, he was working in Environment Production Agency, EPA. Okay, the, he had an opportunity to present a paper on impact of immunization. Uh, WHO organized a seminar in Geneva in 91 October, or maybe early of 92, I don't exactly remember. Because I was a guest with him and he was going to Geneva, I tagged along with him to Geneva Summit, organized by WHO. And uh, I was only a spectator, I cannot understand the ABCD of what they are speaking. Uh, WHO officials were making statements that uh, they were very bitter in their statements that many countries have followed the immunization schedules properly, but there are some countries who do not care about our rights, whatever we are giving. Every newborn child should be vaccinated according to the regimen we are giving, according to the schedule we are giving. And many 90 countries are following, but the rest of the 30, 40 countries are just, they are deaf to our comments. They are not taking initiatives. And such countries, uh, the children are suffering. And major issue is India. In India, at the time, it seems 45 million people, million children, were affected by hepatitis B infection. First time I heard the name hepatitis B. It is a liver infection. And uh, my cousin was briefing me and uh, he was giving me in, in and out of that small, in a small way that I could not understand what they were speaking. But the main scope of the lectures, any speaker was giving the lecture was that India and China and other countries, neighboring countries like uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, etc., they were not adopting hepatitis B into the immunization tube. And they are not caring about their children. They are coming with a begging bowl for subsidized vaccines as and when there is an epidemic. Epidemic, you know, now for COVID, how much hangama we did. In those times, in 92, 93, when 45 million children were affected with hepatitis B and 1% of the affected children can get into liver cirrhosis and they can die with liver cancer. It can affect even adults also. Uh, it is, it, death rate may not be much, but, but the productivity of the adults will go down and uh, they will be most burdensome for the society. They cannot uh, deliver anything they will be dependent on the family they, with the affected liver. They, they are not normal. Uh, most of the times, they may die with liver cirrhosis. At the time, they made a statement that more people, more number of people die in a day because of hepatitis B than due to AIDS in a year. So the seriousness is very high. AIDS was just now coming up. That news is coming up that every country is having eight cases. But WHO themselves made a statement, more people die in a day because of hepatitis B than due to AIDS in a year. That was the seriousness. And they gave a mandate that by 1997, every nation should adopt hepatitis B into their immunization schedule. In immunization schedule, you know, our conventional vaccines like uh, DPT, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella, BCG, that's the TB vaccine. These are the things in the immunization tube. Now they are asking us to add 
hepatitis B. Then I asked my cousin why we, along with uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, etc., why India has not added this vaccine into Malaysia? That is very costly and uh, it is not available in the local currency if we have to import it. I tried to get this. Why, why not this uh, be done in India? It is difficult. I don't know about much about that, but you can we can inquire about that. That's what my cousin said. Then I came back to India. I approached some stalwarts in the pharmaceutical line. They are big companies. They are well-known people. Uh, for example, Patanjali D. And I approached them. They said that uh, it is uh, what you are talking is hepatitis B. They have done it in the recombinant DNA technology. It is a high end of biotechnology. Uh, we are not ready for it. It will take time. It will, minimum it will take 20 to 30 years. That's what his opinion. Then I inquired about the same thing with some other company in Ahmedabad. They also said that, sir, it is a biotech based vaccine. We cannot do that. Recombinant technology is very new. Uh, it was introduced in 1988 and uh, the vaccine came in 88. Uh, recombinant technology. We are not uh, well versed. There is no biotech company as such in the country at the time. Then, when they cannot do, they don't want to do it, I thought I should do it. Though it is not my subject, the kind of insulting words they were uttering in the Geneva seminar, that begging countries coming with a begging bowl for subsidy vaccines, they don't care about their children, etc., was very hurting. So I took the plunge to get this technology and get it manufactured here. That is a irrational thinking because I'm an entrepreneur at the time. <laughs> I don't know the domain life sciences. I do not have any idea. And it is newly introduced in US also, 88. I'm talking about 92, four years. And people here, stalwarts who know the technology or else at least the vaccines and the pharma, they were afraid to take it up and they were of the opinion it will take some time to take that challenge of making recombinant vaccines in the country. I, I was thinking out of box and then I was rational in my thinking. Yeah, yeah, dashed on to US. I approached the company which is making this. They developed this and they have transferred the technology to SKB, Smith Clan Bisham in UK. And in France also, they were doing this vaccine. I approached US company. They were also very reluctant to give this technology by making me to wait for one week to give me an appointment. And uh, the gentleman was very, unfortunately, very, uh, what you call, unparliamentary with me. He said that you are a big country, you don't need a vaccine, you have enough children. Very hurting. And he also said that you are a poor country, you can't afford the high cost vaccine technology. Maybe I can accept that because money is not, that is freely available in India to take up a project like this. Then the last word what he uttered was very insulting. Even though you can afford to pay me technology fee and I give the technology to you, it will take three decades for you to absorb this technology and get into a vaccine production. So forget about it, he said. I made a challenge to him that in two to three years, I'll come back to you with a better vaccine than yours. But that is also foolish, uh, rather un un unwanted or unwarranted statement with him. I came back, my cousin warned me not to pick up any war and uh, such kind of utterances will lead him in trouble because he's a government employee. Uh, and I am a visitor, which I am not supposed to talk in those days. I know the kind of uh, environment in 1970s when I went to US, I was not allowed to park in the same parking lot where other Americans park. For Asians, there is a separate parking slot. That was the discrimination at the time in 70s and in 90s. It may be a little different, uh, but definitely not fully comfortable. The kind of opinion they have about India is, India is lagging behind by 30 years. I don't want to agree with that. And I came back. Then I have taken up the plunge myself. I don't know the technology. And there is no model to emulate 
there is no biotech company. More than anything, I have no data on that. I approach Union Health Ministry to meet Joint Secretary in Union Health Ministry. Uh, I met him and uh, he advised me that your background doesn't suit to take it up and there are vaccine companies, they would have taken up. But all vaccine companies so far, what they are doing, conventional vaccines, are either they are importing bulk and then filing them here, or they are buying the technology and making them here, or they are importing and selling it, but not develop by themselves any vaccine here. All vaccine development is not done in India, it's only either in Holland or Europe or someplace. I was surprised. My opinion is we have Central University, which is famous for life sciences. We have CCMB, Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology. We have NII in Delhi, National Institute of Immunology. We have NIV in Pune, National Institute of Virology. So many institutes are there, and in CSIR laboratories, there are 40 laboratories attached to CSIR. So much of research is going on. Many stalwarts are working in research. If they are given a task by central government, by any leader, that we have to have this vaccine to save our children, they could have definitely done it. My opinion is it was ignored or it was not remembered to take up this kind of task. It is a lack of vision, not lack of technology, not lack of knowledge, and lack of awareness also. Until such time, WHO warned us that if we don't take up this immunity schedule from by 1987, they warned us they will not give support for any health programs in India and neighboring countries. They said they will stop all the support for any health-related projects. Government took it very casually in those days. In my opinion, it didn't occur to, to them to take up this task they could have easily handled this vaccine. It's not a, a rocket science. The component science is a new, agreed. But we have excellent laboratories. And ISRO, DRDO, they have done so much of good work. I think I should mention here, though it is out of place, ISRO done such a kind of wonderful work with fraction of the cost of what NASA is spending, we could achieve almost the same results as NASA got. We are maybe two, three years behind. But in some areas, we are even far ahead of them. We could launch 108 satellites at one go. They could not launch more than six or seven. We could launch 108. Our uh, ISRO is no way inferior to NASA. My strong belief is our scientists are very strong. Their science is very good. Our engineers are very good. Even in America, which is, in my opinion, is a what you call... Um, uh, country of immigrants. Most of the doctors are Indians, successful doctors. Most of the engineers working in either Apple or in, uh, Microsoft or whatever it is, they are all from India. So our own people are going there and working. Can we not do it ourselves? Is my blind jump into the project. Here, I didn't make any calculation what is the supply demand gap where is the technology, whether we have trained manpower, whether we have hands-on experience to people to take up this project, whether I'm going to get adequate funding from the banks. I didn't have any idea what is the size of the project, how much equipment, what equipment I require, how much project size it is, I don't have. It's a blind gem. That's what uh, one stalwart from Pharma said, you are taking a blind gem you are a fool, you are an idiot. I don't know how we'll come out of this, but don't be so emotional. It's not good for you. That is the advice I got. Anyway, I told you in the beginning itself, definition of an entrepreneur. You should be a radical thinker. You should be foolish sometimes. You should be bullish also. And he will not have anything to lose. What I have, I could not get my partner, whatever he supposed to give me, he didn't give it, has gone to court. I have to again approach my father for some money and what all he could give is, he, he didn't sell away all his property, but part of the, his land property he sold and gave me some 68 lakhs in 93, he has given me. My friends and cousins, my classmate, 
three or four of them gave me some money. All together pulled up is two crores, which is not enough. I know that. At the time, Usman University Vice Chancellor happened to know me. I told him my, my episode. He has offered free space in molecular biology department, the dilapidated room of 20 by 40, with broken chairs and tables. I got it cleaned up. A false ceiling and false roofing was done, and fa false uh, flooring also done. Some air conditioners were fitting. He attached me a molecular biology professor, associate professor, Dr. Geeta Sharma. She started teaching me what it is, and she helped me in formulating a project report. She was teaching recombinant technology in the class for MSc students. I told you, in the universities, the subject is there, it is being taught. Maybe they are doing some experiments, but not for a product. It is a learning curve. But if it is designed for a product, it is designed for making a product, I think our scientists could have done That's my opinion. We made a project report and we applied to, at that time, Ujjogba in Delhi, we applied for it. Finally, I could not get answer for three or four months. And again, I, went, I made another application. I could not get reply. I went and searched. I found it with the help of one Telugu person in Ujjog Bhavan working in the industry of industry. He located that in the engineering department waiting for clearance without knowing what it is. They were confused. Our heading of the project, I mean report for getting the license is genetically engineered hepatitis B vaccine. Genetically engineered, they saw only engineering aspect. They were sent it to engineering department where they approve lathes, machines, big mechanical machines. So finally, I got it back and then we taught them this. Why, why I tell this is the kind of awareness in government circles is this. Newly formed Department of Biotechnology was there. I went there. They, they also felt that I am not 